Hi, this is the, the Stacy from the Advisor, and today we have Kuros, uh, Dr. Kuros Mer here, and he is he, a, a physician and scientist, and he has a wonderful new book out called Breakthrough: Master Your Default Mode and Thrive. And a lot of people aren't sure what default mode network really means. But today he's going to go over it and he's going to talk about how it pertains to many different conditions such as anxiety, how it can uh, addiction, how it can even um, affect depression and many other conditions that a majority of our so society here today, you know, battles with. So today he has a lot of great information and what's so great about it is not only does he talk about the mind, body and the spirit, but he also backs it up by science. So uh, Dr. Um, Koros Mer, can you please tell us what um, a little about yourself and what you sure. do? I'd love to. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to, to tell you about some of these discoveries. Um, my background, I'm a physician scientist by training. So I work in oncology, developing medicines for cancer. I've been doing this for over two decades. And um, I wrote this book because of just excitement over what's happening in neuroscience and understanding how the brain works. And what's what I'm finding is science and medicine are now taking a seat at the table with uh, you know spirituality and and mental health, mental well-being. Um, and these new discoveries, particularly the default mode network, is really shedding light on how the brain works. And it just has such big implications for, for folks out there and would love to tell you some more about it. Yeah, I, I'd love to hear about it because I, th I think it's very important because today, um, you know, for the longest time, they kind of separated um, doctors only focused on science. And, you know, there was a lot of um, confliction because, you know, I, I would hear many patients say, well, you don't know how I feel. You're not going through it. You know, and now doctors are trying to really understand the concept of what their patients are going through, understand how, you know, how wellness and, and how the mind, the body and the spirit connect and how they can correlate it with science and have a gr better grasp and better understanding, which makes it really good because when you do converse with your patients, there is a bond there because you're you're getting it. It's not all about science. It goes further and more deeper than that. And maybe you can explain to people how it goes deeper and how sure. the default mode network actually takes place and all that. Yeah, absolutely. So for context, you know, when I was in medical school, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't really talk about spirituality. I don't think that was ever mentioned yeah. <laughs> you know, during medical school. Um, but what's happening now is clinical studies are starting to show the health benefits of spirituality and all of the qualities that you see across all of the religions. Um, and, and really those discoveries about the brain. So it turns out our brain has at least seven networks that, that, perform functions for us. So you've got the visual network. Mm -hmm. It helps us see. You've got the auditory network. It helps us hear. And then you've got three networks that are really at the gateway to mental health and well-being, spirituality. And, and this is all new science. So one of them is called default mode network. It is essentially your self, your ego, uh, and it's your wandering mind. So anytime you're in the present, you're focused on something at work or you're driving, let's say, and your brain wanders away from the present moment, yes. maybe takes you to the past, thinking about some old memories or thinking about the future and has you worried about it. That's actually a part of your brain that turns on. It's called the default mode network. You can actually see it on an MRI scan. It's pretty amazing. Really? Um, and and so there, I mentioned there's three of them. So that's one of them, default mode network. Another one is called central executive network. It's just a different part of your brain. And it it has a more expansive consciousness. Um, when you're fully present, whether you're praying, meditating, or or just fully, you know, immersed in a song, you're set that's your central executive that's on. And in that state, you're free of the mental chatter. And that is more of your observing mind rather than your wandering mind. So you've got default mode network, wandering mind, um, and then you've got central executive, which is more of your observing mind. We all need a healthy default mode network um, mm -hmm. to, to function. But for many of us, the wandering mind is on all the time. And it contributes to things like anxiety, 
depression, um, emotional pain and PTSD, ADHD. Um, and we're seeing all this in science that it's, it's basically an overactive default mode that can give us a lot of problems. So the purpose of this book, this is a book about self-discovery, about you understanding how your brain works, but it's also about healing and it's also about personal growth by understanding your brain and, and figuring out how to have this default mode work for you and not against you. Because I notice a lot of times, like we all have the ability to have anxiety, to have depression, to have ADHD, because we all have a little bit of, of attention deficit disorder, dependent on the situation and, and what's going on in our lives. And, you know, there are many people who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, when you wander off, you, you, I definitely see individuals start to increase and actually get to the point where it could actually be really unhealthy, because as we know, over 70% of of stress causes illness. So when, if you let this go too long and you let your brain wander into the, the, the uh, default mode network, then you could actually be opening yourself up, it seems, to a lot of different illnesses. But I, I see that as very common, especially when I see people um, cause we all have stress every day we deal with stress, but you see people who have businesses or entrepreneurs or people who are just under stress at work, you know, there's always either they are going back in the past and they're thinking of what happened and could happen again, or they're going into the future and they're thinking about the what ifs and those what ifs may never occur, but yet people have a tendency to go into that, that default mode and start to think of, okay, what if this happens, then this could happen and this could happen. And then they go back into their past. Well, this happened to me, you know, 10 years ago, it could still happen again. You know, it looks like, you know, I see this and this and, and you could really drive yourself nuts. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and a lot, a lot of that is, is almost unconscious type, you know, the wandering mind just sort of takes control and it's almost reflexive and you can get stuck in, in, you know, in that state. So I break down 11 different mental conditions. I call them knots, like sort of knots in a rope that are you know, tied yeah. and at kind of a softer term, but I, there's 11 that I break in, break this down into the first one is stress. And, um, Stress, big driver, as you said, of our health problems, um, but it goes from stress and they're presented in a particular order because a lot of these are interrelated and they mm -hmm. make each other worse. But stress is the first one, emotional pain followed by what I call addictive craving, a little mm -hmm. bit of a softer term for addiction. And there's many types of addictive cravings out there. And then the other ones are loneliness, negativity, anxiety, and anger. Um, there's dissatisfaction, there's dishonesty and denial. Um, or lifestyle, which is sort of sleep, diet, and exercise, yeah. and then resistance to change. Um, there's also inaction, which is sort of like procrastination. But these 11, I break down each of them, sort of the science behind them, and then how the default mode network makes them worse, and then how to heal from these conditions yeah. by basically silencing and healing your default mode network. And there's many ways of, of doing that. And so what are some of the things people could do um, in their home um, to help them actually get out of that default mode um, and get back into a healthier state of mind? Yeah. So the science is showing that uh, people who suffer from some of these um, knots, like let's say anxiety, their, their default mode is overactive. That's actually been shown clinically. Yeah. So things that will silence the default mode, um, anything that can turn on your observing mind so that you're present in this moment. Mm -hmm. Things like breathing exercises, prayer, mindfulness, meditation. Um, and there's hundreds of, of other things. And part of this is, again, self-discovery. It's um, walking through and understanding which of these helps you become present and turn on that observing mind. And for some people, it might be more music, let's say. Uh, it might be walking in nature, it might be gardening, it might be, uh, you know, talking to people, um, mm -hmm. but we're all very different. So the book right. kind of guides you through that so you can understand. So for example, I I'll mention to spend 15 minutes, um, turn off the phone, turn off the distractions and, and try an activity. And first, always take a look at yourself, observe your mind, see how you feel, no matter if it's positive or negative, it doesn't matter, just observe it for a mm -hmm. few seconds. Spend 15 minutes doing, let's say, mindful relaxation, whatever that is. And after 15 minutes, observe your mind again 
like a scientist would and, and understand, wow, this, these activities really work well for me. It really shuts off my default mode yeah. and then build on that. It's, it takes time. It, you know, this is not going to happen overnight, right? but you can definitely overcome high stress, emotional pain, anxiety. You can completely overcome it. Um, and, and this is a journey I also went on. I had all 11 of these knots and mm -hmm. it took me about five or six months, but I resolved right. all of them basically. I feel like a lot of times, you know, it becomes a habit form and behavior, you know, for many people, because you're so used to being in a certain environment and doing the same thing consistently over and over and over again, that your negative behavior becomes more habit forming. And, and you've been in it for so long that it's actually seems normal now to you because you're so used to behaving and, and being the way you are. And then you have to break that in your, in your, in your mind and you have to break those behaviors. Like, do you have any suggestions? Cause that, you know, it, it's, it those exercises and all these changes do work and it helped me actually in my, in my journey in life, but it's for, for people who have a hard time really getting past that denial stage or, or being able to really think that they could break it because some people get so stuck that they yeah. just, their, their mind is kind of in, I call it the, the little gray box. You know, they don't think, think that they could change. How do you get these people that are yeah. habit formed to get out of that? Number one, most important is to set the intention and remind yourself of that intention every day, multiple times a day. You know, maybe your intention is I want to be happy, healthy, you know, with inner peace, reminding yourself of that intention every day is very important, even in, you know, in difficult times. But let's, let's take an example. Let's say emotional pain, right? Let's say you've had an experience from childhood or a recent trauma, divorce, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And your mind is just going back to that memory and giving you that raw emotion and you're suffering from that. Maybe it's like a form of PTSD. Right. So, Part of this is self-discovery, is coming to understand this is just my default mode network that's turning on and reminding me of this memory and bringing this pain back. Yeah. And so, and so, so the key there is to separate the memory from the emotion. Yeah. Many different ways of doing that, but there are things like you can work with a therapist with cognitive behavioral therapy, radical mm -hmm. acceptance therapy. Um, dialectical behavior therapy. These are all outlined in the book. Yes. Um, if you'd rather not work with a therapist, you can do it yourself. There's things like insight meditation, um, using the RAIN technique, where you sort of recognize that the emotion is there, you accept it, yeah. you investigate, and you non-identify. Um, but and if all of and all of this will serve to decrease that default mode network, reduce those emotions, but. You, the, the pain may still come back. Right. So if you want to really effectively turn that pain off forever, right. you can turn to the power of forgiveness, right? That's in almost every religion. Uh, <laughs> and clinical studies are showing that forgiveness exercises, uh, including self-forgiveness, can improve health, even physical health, things like depression oh. and, and even like lung disease. So that's all sort of outlined in it. Um, so I try to list very practical ways uh, some are religious, some are non-religious, um, right. but just giving you the tools to to deal with these things. Yeah. For people who suffer from anxiety, um, you, you talked about mindfulness, you talked about meditation, and you talked about a lot of different exercises that people can do. Um, when you start to, you know, once you become, when you start doing all those exercises, you become more aware of your inner self. And that inner self is, you know, a friend of mine refers to it as your inner stranger no longer is a stranger. Now you're well aware of who that inner self is. But once you get to that point, when you're actually understanding who you are and that inner self, when you start to see yourself wander off, because then you're more aware of what's going on. How do you stop yourself? Yeah. So it's not that you're trying to stop the default mode or get angry when it shows up. Mm -hmm. What you're trying to do is to strengthen your observing mind, your central executive. Okay. And the, the more that you empower that observing mind, and this is like, um, like exercise or anything else, the more you do it, the, the stronger it becomes. Mm -hmm. So that observing mind, initially it might be kind of like a, like a dim candle, right? But as you strengthen it every day, it becomes brighter and brighter and eventually it becomes like a high like a high beam almost yeah 
And when that observing mind, which you can also call your higher self or your inner self, which you, which you describe, as it becomes stronger, you, you'll still get the default mode turning on, but you can recognize it as it shows up and you with gratitude, right? You're not getting right. angry at it. You can say, oh, hi, default mode. You're, <laughs> you're trying to uh, remind me of something again. And as soon as you observe it, it just disappears. Right. So like today, I'll, I'll have anxious thoughts and worries. And before it bubbles up into some anxiety or anger, I yeah. see it, I give some gratitude to it, and it just disappears. Um, and stress will always be there. It's part of life. We need stress to to actually get through our lives, right? And and right. Uh, get through difficult times. Um, but when when your observing mind is strong enough, you see the message in the stress and you deal with it without it, you know, turning into like a fight or flight response kind of thing. Right. So, yeah. So do you feel like um, when it comes to gratitude, because I notice a lot of people don't, you know, they, people lack gratitude and the people who lack gratitude, sometimes we don't realize what we have until it's gone. And that's when people really wake up and then they start to be, have gratitude because they realize how precious the littlest things in life are. Do you suggest something like journaling something, you know, would that be a good exercise for someone to promote, you know, an increase in their, their gratitude in their lives? Yeah. So I'll just say loneliness and, and negativity, very common. It's actually also triggered by this default mode network because the default mode network, it is, it's kind of like our old brain when we sort of evolved in the wild. It's, it's yeah. very reactive and it's very judgmental. And it has this inherent belief that we are different from others. We're separate from others. Others are different from us. That's default mode network. So, um, and, and the way to silence that and overcome it is by actively cultivating compassion, like you said, gratitude, you know, compassion, studies have shown compassion actually reduces stress, cuts it in half yeah, and improves health. And this is something you, it's like an exercise that you cultivate. So I, sometimes I'm walking down the street and I see somebody walking towards me and I'll just give them some well wishes. I'll just yeah. mentally, it takes a few seconds, but just giving them gratitude as opposed to what your default mode wants to do, which is right. turn away, look away, walk, you know, cross the street. That's what your brain's default mode wants to do. So you have to recognize that it's there. Oh, here's my default mode. It makes me think I'm different. Yeah. And instead silence it and turn on that compassion, turn on that gratitude. And that will do wonders for your health. You know, even I, I, I noticed that a lot of times I will throw out a compliment to someone I don't know. I, I'll be walking and maybe that person's wearing a pretty purple shirt. And I'll say, wow, that's a really nice shirt. And you'll see them like just glow. And then you'll feel that, you know, you'll feel good about yourself because now you just saw that you just inspired or made somebody happy just by just a, a small little compliment that you gave that person. I agree. You'll Then that's, you, you'll find that compassion at the heart of, Buddhism, Christianity, I mean, all the world's religions, and it's who we are, it's who we are as, as humans, right? I mean, yes. there was a, so 80,000 years ago, <laughs> there was this, um, it's called the Tub T Toba Supervolcano. It was this event that happened, um, it's put the world into this nuclear winter for 10 years, scientists think. Our ancestors, most of them died off, and there was only a few hundred remaining. Wow. There was like 10 years of starvation, basically. And the only way we made it through that period was just unconditional compassion and, and altruism for our for our kids. Yeah. That's how we made it because human babies are just helpless. Yes. And so that, I mean, that's, so who we are really in our core is compassionate and, and altruistic, but this default mode wants us to, you know, compete and survive and, uh, and win. And so it puts us on this trajectory where we think that to succeed, we've got to beat others. We have to win, but it, that it takes us down this lonely road, you know, unintentionally. Yeah. So we have to kind of reorient and shift ourselves back to who we, who we really are. Oh, I agree a hundred percent. And I've seen that in many people, you know, when you go down that road, they, they do become very lonely and they do become very stressed and all the, all the different conditions that you mentioned, it, it taps into their lives and then it just evolves. It, if, it, the, if the problem isn't addressed, you know, in the proper way, you, you see it to me, it, it, I, I, I feel from other people who I've seen this happen to, and even myself in my own past, 
it it um it it elevates and becomes a bigger and bigger bigger problem to the point where I think it's like a pot of boiling water, and then the person feels like the water is starting to boil over, and then they have no control. Exactly. So I think coming to recognize that this default mode, it's actually not who you really are, um, and it it does you know the, the what it's doing because it's trying to help you, it's trying to protect you, and you know try to ensure your success. Um, but, and it's great when you're younger and you're in high school and, and this default mode wants you to be the best and succeed and beat others and discover who you are. The problem is that same mentality later in life makes us lonely and depressed and anxious. So coming to understand it with this intention that I want to transcend this and I want to be a happy person, yeah. um, I think is is key and critical right now. Like you said, this is a mental well-being is such an important topic, right? It is. And in the one thing I like is that it's become more um, popular. People are really starting to see the importance of mental uh, wellness. And, and it's also not a stigma anymore. People are coming out and they're talking about mental health and it's not, it's not being hit anymore, you know, where someone had problems and they had mental issues that they were addressing, you know, there was a stigmatism, a labelism in our society where it seems like it's being more accepted by society and that there is that stigma is slowly you know decreasing for sure yeah and we you know we still have a long way to go but i think uh yeah i'm definitely seeing it in in medicine i'm seeing it i live right here near ucla and i'm starting to see like the mindfulness center at ucla when i go to the doctor they're um encouraging things like you know, meditation, yoga, and, and prayer, which I, I had never seen that in medicine. So yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's really refreshing. And I think this is just the beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, it. so if you look at cancer, if you look at cardiology, a lot of times there were medicines that actually came from plants um, that where newer medicines came, you know, sort of decades after. So cardiology, for example, Digitalis, there are plants that, and we found that, wow, these plants actually improve blood pressure. Right. We use those to develop all of the blood pressure medicines we have today. Same with cancer. There were plants, um, plant medicines that eventually turned into chemotherapy. What yeah. we're finding now is there are plant medicines that shut off the default mode network. They're oh, very right. crude. Yeah, they don't, I mean, they've got side effects. I'm sure you've heard of, I mean, these are things like, you know, uh, psilocybin and, you know, psychedelics. Yeah, that's how they work. They actually shut off the default mode network, but they're not for everybody. They can cause side effects for now. They're illegal, but we're understanding how these medicines work. I think over the next 10, 20 years, we're going to develop some really new, really good medicines that have fewer side effects. that can really help people to shut off this sort of mm -hmm. monkey mind. Um, so it's just the beginning, I think. Yeah, I, I and it, and it's it's kind of hopeful because even with medical marijuana for so many years they they related marijuana back to the 70s and how it was only a more power, you know party type drug where then later on they found out that wow that there is there's over a thousand strands in one marijuana leaf and how it affected each part of the brain and you know how it could help in so many different ways in so many conditions and I think when it comes to the default mode network I think I think they're gonna the same things going to happen they're going to find new and natural ways along with different you know mindset and in different um ways to actually you know calm the body relax the body and change yourself to be, be in a more observant mode than default mode which will actually help improve people's health in, in many ways because if we could actually do this naturally and we didn't have to resort back to all these different medications that people are currently on that have so many different side effects and you know and, and you know there's so many medications even for for depression but then depression can make you chronically fatigue the, the medications and then some of them numb people's emotions and then they don't feel any emotions so they don't feel a depression or the anxiety if they're taking anxiety medications because it, they're turning off signals in the brain that automatically, you know, react to their emotions. But how That's good right. is that for a person? You know, I agree. Yeah, for sure. I mean, anxiety and depression, if you go to a doctor, th there are, there are good medicines out there that will reduce the symptoms Yes. for depression. These like SSRIs for half the patients, you know, their symptoms will be cut in half. 
which is good. It's not good enough in my opinion. Right. Um, but I, you know, I talk about techniques in the book where you can get at the root cause yeah. of some of these issues. And maybe the root cause, maybe the root cause is emotional pain. Right. That, and uh, which is leading to the depression. But, and you can either do this with a therapist or there are ways to do it by yourself to have this self-discovery. But I have to say depression, for example, there are patients who even with the therapist, even with mindfulness and prayer and these SS, SSRIs, they still suffer. And so that's called refractory depression. The gold standard treatment for patients with refractory depression, believe it or not, is called electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, mm -hmm. where patients are basically, you know, shocked. Yeah. Um, obviously it works because uh, it's approved. So it does it does work and I've, I've seen it. But studies are showing now that a single dose of like psilocybin given in a treatment setting with a therapist can really heal patients with refractory depression. I mean, the results are pretty amazing. Wow. So I think we're going to start to see these approved over the next year. Mm -hmm. And folks like Rick Doblin have been working on this. And Rick actually endorsed this book. But we're, we're starting to understand how these medicines work and how they should be given. And by the way, I do not recommend doing these recreationally. I know people are going out and doing it. Yeah. But these are very powerful medicines. Like if you had cancer, you wouldn't give yourself chemotherapy, right? Exactly. You work with a licensed professional who knows what they're doing. So you have to treat these with respect and, and do it properly. Yeah. But, but there, you know, there are new tools coming and it's, it's just going to be really exciting. It is very exciting. And I, I, you know, people have to also realize it, a lot of people think they could be their own doctor and, and a lot of these, you know, different medications and, and, and all these these different treatments when you're when you a lot of them could be addicted to the body and then when you start to wean yourself off of it many people will think they could just stop these 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 medications or stop these you know different things that they're doing and they could actually shut their body down and they could actually cause really bad effects or even death if they do it the wrong way they should always have a doctor you know, monitoring them and, and, and also giving them routine blood checkups and different tests and so forth. So they know exactly where they're at and, and it's done the proper way because, um, the, you know, people don't realize the complexity when it, when you're, when you're going through a different condition and you're on different medications or they're trying to find the right medication, it's not, you know, just let's try a pillow. It doesn't work. You know, I'll, tr you know, stop it. You know, it's just not the way it works. And sometimes it takes a, a while before a medication medication can actually, um, you know, take effect, full effect to the way they, they want it to have, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, these days there is many different kinds of support. So, uh, obviously your doctor is a great resource, but there's, there's online psychotherapy now, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of companies, their human resources actually have support there. Um, and, and so if, if you need help, get, you know, get the help, talk to somebody about it, don't fight it alone and um, and have that intention. As long as you have that intention that I'm, I, I really want to be better and happier and healthier, I think start reaching out. And I've, I've listed a lot of these tools in this book, but um, yeah, I think that those days are gone where you just have to fight this alone. Um, now I think is the time to talk about it, get the help, find yeah. support groups where you've got other friends, you know, dealing with this as well. And I thought you made a, a great um, point when you said get into the root cause, because a lot of times it could be one thing in your life and it could be so repressed that people don't even realize that it still exists. And that's the reason why they're having such uh, an impact and how it's having an impact in their lives. And a lot of the symptoms and a lot of the feelings and behaviors they're going through could be caused by that one specific thing and having a therapist to talk to and being able to actually, you know, be able to speak with your therapist and find that ultimate, you know, root cause could actually help heal a person. And then you add the, the different types of, um, you know, mindfulness, and then you meditation, you know, prayer, learn how to forgive, because if you have people that, you know, in your lives, we, a lot of people tend to hold on to things, which is the worst thing you can do, or even situations that have happened. Sometimes you have to just let go. And for a lot of people, that's very hard. But I'm sure that's one of the things that people wander off into their default mode is, you know, things that they can't change, you know, either past situations or like we said, worrying about the what ifs that we don't even know about. Yeah. Yeah. So 
you know, those 11 mental knots, I, I put them in a very particular order at starting off with stress, as I mentioned, and then getting into emotional pain. Cause once you, um, sort of unwind and break through stress and, and especially that old emotional pain, it makes it a lot easier to address number three, which is the addiction or the addictive craving. There's yeah. many of us who are addicted. And so what it, we all have cravings. It's normal to have a craving, yeah. but it's when that craving causes harm to you and or your family that it becomes an addictive craving. And it's not just nicotine and alcohol drugs, right? It, it could be um, food and, and gambling and uh, any number, your smartphone, I mean, all kinds of issues. But if you get through those three, then it becomes a lot easier to break through loneliness and yes. negativity and that judgmental negative type of thinking, which makes it easier to get through anxiety. So yeah, this is a holistic approach. And I would definitely recommend a holistic approach. Um, don't just rely on a, on one therapist, yeah. but try different. And there's many kinds of, you mentioned mindfulness, there's many kinds of mindfulness practice. One thing that worked well for me, insight meditation, mm -hmm. which some people call Vipassana, you basically, you do mindfulness, but you look for three types of thoughts, craving, aversion, and, and ignorance or ignorant thoughts. You just look for those three, you identify them when they show up and mm -hmm. that's all you're supposed to do. But when you, when you do that with your observing mind, you really understand a lot about, about you and, and the root causes of some of your issues. So that's talk, I talk about that in the book also. I like that. I think that 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 it would be very helpful for people because when you do become more observant and you you are able to to get through that, you know, you could break those addictions, you can break those 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 problems that are occurring. And it does seem like it it is just like like um like symptoms of of a illness. It, it, you just you start to see you know it takes pattern. It's, it seems like it goes from one to the next to the next, and it just elevates as as you go along. That's right. And you've got a powerful part of your brain. Um, well, some people will call it your subconscious mind. Some people who are of faith will say, you know, insights from God, right? Mm -hmm. There is, however you want to call it, there is a higher power uh, that will give you the insights to, to lead you out of the darkness, right? Yes. And, um, and so just keeping that intention and relying on those insights, waiting for them to come, and again, whether it's your subconscious mind or 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 God or how, whatever you want to believe, it will lead you out of that um, yeah. through self understanding. Yeah, I always say that you listen. You should listen to your intuition because a lot of times, if you do listen to your intu intuition, most of the time your intuition is always right. And it's those times where you're like, oh, I don't know if I should, and your your inner self is saying, no, I don't think you should. And then you say, ah, oh, what the heck, I will. And then all of a sudden you know, you're like, oh, why did I do that? You know, and yeah. there's a really good quote. Uh, St. Augustine said, God provides the wind, but man must raise his sails. So when those insights come, you you have to act. And uh, it may be uncomfortable, but, you know, do what what this higher power is is guiding you to. And yeah, very important. I agree with you. I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's it's so important for um for people to really connect with themselves. And I think if by connecting with your your inner self and and by giving yourself the chance, because a lot of people, you know, that negativity comes in. Oh, I can't do it. You know, that lack of worthiness. I I I can't do that. You don't understand what I'm going through. You know, um. But if they did give themselves the chance, you know, they could actually like you like your book break through it. You know, it's it, yeah holistic living and, and, and applying all the things that you talked about today can make a humongous impact on your life. I know for me, it made a humongous impact on my life. And most of the different types of, um, uh, holistic living techniques that you mentioned in our discussion today, you know, I practice and it did make a huge difference in the way I thought, the way I reacted to things, the way I, I, I felt I was able to actually control my stress level and not let things get to me, you know, and, and there are days where we're all human and things get to us. But to the most part, I was able to control a lot of that where in the before, you know, before holistic living, before applying all the, all the techniques you discussed, it was very hard to. Excellent. That's great to hear. You know, I hope, I hope more people can, can be like that. Um, you know, you mentioned negativity. Our, our brain is wired 
to focus on the negative. It's actually called the negativity bias. Mm -hmm. And it, that's why the nightly news starts with the worst stories. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just how our brains are wired. So coming to understand that and using a tool called, it's called equanimity. All it is, is just recognizing the good and the bad and not gravitating towards the negative. Yeah. But staying in the center, acknowledging any emotion, but letting it go off on its way and making your decisions based on, you know, more of logic and reason. Um, you can break free of, of negativity. Negativity, <laughs> I have a lot of uh, family and friends kind of just stuck in that, in yeah. that judgmental sort of negative state. And um, But you can overcome it. You can completely get out of that state. Well, you could also notice that when you're around them, you probably feel like the energy has been sucked out of you after you've been around <laughs> yeah. them. You know, I, I feel, you know, when you have people that are negative around you, because good energy draws good people and vice versa, you sometimes have to separate yourself a little from those people. That doesn't mean that you have to exclude them out of your life. Cause like you mentioned, if they're family members, that's a little hard to do, but if you distance yourself and learn not to let them get to you and focus on the positive, then, you know, it, it won't affect you as bad, but it, it's funny you say that because when things happen, you can, we always remember the negative things that have happened to us in our lives, but then you say, make a list of all the, the good things, you know, about certain times in your life. And you're more apt to remember the, the negative than you are the, Absolutely. the good things. That's the negativity bias. Yeah. And, um, also a hallmark of default mode network. So if you think about it, this is, we spent so many tens of thousands of years, right, in in the wilderness and with uh, predators and things. And so our brain was wired to always look for the negative things to, to, that helped us survive, actually. Right. Um, and stress, like always reacting to that with fight or flight, either constantly fighting or running away. Um, and all of that helped get us here. But we don't need to rely on that, on those sort of primitive parts of our brain anymore. And um, right. but it's a hard thing to undo. You yeah. have to consciously learn about it, recognize it, and then push towards a, a higher state. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I think that's very important. And I like that you talked about therapy also, because I think it's very important for people to be able to be talk to somebody from with an unbiased opinion. And I think that helps a lot also. And also they could help, you know, you're coming up with the answers, not the therapist, and you're able to let go of that, th those things that are going on in your, in your life. And it actually is, is a healing process. So you could have a clearer mind and you could probably be more in contact with, you know, with your, your central, you know, thoughts mm -hmm. and, right. and your default mode and, and be able to control it and being able to control, you know, instead of you see people that kind of lose it right, right away. You'll, you'll see people that, don't, you only have to say one or two words and then they just completely lose it. And then you see people who are nice and calm and they handle things, you know, and I, I think that would be when you, when you see people who kind of just, you only do as it takes is two or three words and they just go off the handle. I would say that is part of the default mode, right? Or no. Yeah. Yeah. And you can probably guess that that person might be very reactive, might suffer from maybe some anxiety or irritability. And um, and it's an easy way to drive people away, right? By constantly being reactive. Yeah. So you, that's nothing that's hardwired. You can you can change and heal at any age. Right. We're always uh, changing and adapting. So just because you're an extremely reactive person doesn't mean you have to stay that way. If you have again right. that intention to want to be happy and healthy, you can get to a place that's happier, you know, peaceful and, and less reactive. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, but you can follow this process and, and get to where you want to go. Now, if you had to take a, give the audience a couple of takeaways and things you want to emphasize that you feel of a, or importance, what would you like to tell our listeners? Yeah, I think, um, so we talked about a lot of these, um, knots already. Uh, one of them that I didn't talk about the very last one, is, um, well, let me talk about lifestyle first. So lifestyle is diet, sleep, and exercise. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of good, you know, um, weight loss regimens out there already, medications or exercise programs, et cetera. You can lose, you know, 10, 20, 30 pounds of weight in, in months. But the problem is the weight usually comes back for the majority of people. And that's because a lot of us overeat to deal with our 
challenging emotions, to deal right. with our stress and anxiety. We we overeat as a way of coping with our stress. So once you resolve these knots, it becomes a lot easier to keep a normal you know diet and keep the yeah. weight off. Um, that's actually you know getting at the root causes of, of overeating. Sleep is the same way. The default mode can prevent us from sleeping well with all the thoughts that are racing and our wandering mind. So when you learn to calm that down, you'll sleep better. And right. because you sleep better and you're eating better, you'll have more focus during the day. And and focus is is a is a whole chapter on itself and how the brain focuses. Yeah. Uh, but all of these knots are all interrelated. And once you resolve a little bit of stress, it makes for a, a lot easier, you know, weight loss and and keeping a good healthy lifestyle. Um, Another one I just wanted to mention is around focus and how the brain focuses. There's yeah. actually a part of the brain, it's called the blue spot, and it's how we're able to focus. Uh, and there are ways of doing exercises to improve your focus. So if you suffer from ADHD or have a hard time focusing, you can actually train your brain to, to spend more time in the present. Um, I talk about that in the book. And then the very last knot is resistance to change and sort of stubbornness. Even if we were able to overcome all the knots, there might be something that happens, you know, uh, unfortunately, some traumatic event or something that tries to pull us back into that darkness. So yeah. keeping our resilience strong every day, whether it's through, you know, prayer, mindfulness, spirituality, whatever it is, very important to sort of keep yourself um, uh, not resistant to change, but welcoming change yes. when it happens as a way of, you know, developing you basically. So there's a lot more in the book, but you can see, you can preview the book for free at yourdefaultmode.com. Uh, the book is available on Amazon. I'll put some, you know, this podcast I'll put on the website. And uh, the purpose of this book is just to help folks out there. There's That's really all it is. That's wonderful. And you also written, I heard a couple of novels in, in the, you, you've written. Yeah, I, a couple of novels, but the theme is very similar actually. So Project Bodhi, is a self-help book disguised as a novel. And so the main character is a guy who's uh, um, really distracted, let's just say, <laughs> but he's able to um, overcome all of this. And this is before I learned about default mode. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so that the book is actually, I wrote it about seven or eight years ago, but it's, it's, it's sort of a futuristic book about life in 2029, which oh, wow. a lot of the things are like, I talk all about AI and yeah. uh, a, a lot of the things are actually coming true. But um, so that was the first book. The second book is a novel about uh, the year 2066, where sort of climate change takes over. I hope that doesn't ever come true. But yeah. um, anyway, those were novels. But <laughs> That's wonderful. This has been amazing. I really thank you for coming on the show. And thank you so much for your time. Now, it's the, it's the yourdefaultmode.com is where they can find you. Are you on any social networks or anything if they want to go to that? At the very bottom of the site, yeah, you'll see links to my Instagram page, you know, Facebook, TikTok, et cetera. And uh, yourdefaultmode at gmail.com is the email if, if you'd like to reach me for any reason. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. I really appreciate your time. And this has been wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. You have a great day. You too. Take care.